uh, make each segment of the class uh, springboard off of somebody that I've read after that really knows what they're talking about. But, uh, and I've done that for the most part for the class, but a couple of weeks ago I sat in my office and I was contemplating where to go from here with the study. There's still a lot more, a lot of additional topics. Uh, usually when I begin something like this, I take out a legal pad and I just start scribbling ideas and then I end up ranking them when, when I want to, I don't always date them from the outset, that would be too uh, type A. Uh, that would be something Trudy does, not, 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 not quite for you. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> um, every idea you stretch out, you go ahead and put a date on when you're going to talk about it. I'm not quite that organized. But uh, I was sitting there thinking, you know, I know when you've had this word uh, enabling, and it has come to have a really negative connotation. If somebody says to you, you're an enabler, that's not meant to be a compliment. But I, I want to approach it as we started last week. I want us to think about how we can uh, enable our children in a good way. And I'm not talking here just to mom and dad, I'm also talking to grandparents and to friends and families that have little children. How can we be good, wholesome enablers, helping our children to grow and develop? Now, uh, as I also mentioned, we don't have, I don't feel obligated to, to tag a scripture on every little word of uh, recommendation that we give in the class. I, I want it to be biblical. I'm not uh, constrained to have to say this, we derive this point from this passage. But uh, uh, again, maybe just to start out here from Ephesians 6, which gives us a broad, a broad instruction for home builders. It's twofold. First of all, children, obey your parents in the Lord. <coughs> for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Uh, that is translated in more modern translations. Obey your mother and father lest they kill you early. And then verse 4, fathers do not provoke your children to anger. But really the focus is what we're trying to talk about in this class. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So when I, when I thought, well, let's talk about some positive ways that we can enable. I just started thinking about, and my, I started thinking about where, where, where are some areas. And, and the first one that, that we uh, talked about last week, well, what was the first one? Um, it's uh, teaching accountability. Now, that wasn't the first one. The first one was, was stability. Providing them with stability. We're, we're talking about what can we do to nourish or to enable our children to grow up. First of all, to grow up and then to, to grow up and have a, a, a really positive, wholesome, Christian life. So it, it is given to us by God. We, I think we have an obligation to provide them with stability. And we talked about that at length. We don't need to rehearse it all uh, this morning, although some of you weren't here with us. But stability comes in so many different ways. Uh, we illustrated uh, Tom Kennedy has lived in Miami all of his days, or at least most all of his days. So he's he's one of these uh, rare creatures in our world today, although some of you fall into that category, who has basically lived in the same area uh, for all of his life. Uh, on the other hand, we co contrasted him with Jeannie, whose father was a preacher in, in a time period when preachers moved quite often. So uh, she has lost count of how many schools she went to. And what did you say? Well, I... You can come up with it. I, 
That's a figure of speech. You know? <laughs> So uh, she moved every couple of years. And so you could say, well, Tom had stability, Jeannie didn't have stability. But even in Jeannie's circumstance, her parents uh, canopied her upbringing with, with great stability. She never wondered if she would come home and her mom and dad would be divorced. That's quite a... A, a positive point of stability in our world today. And I used that last week to, to tell our young, young parents, uh, Charlie, you and Chris, uh, Haley just stepped out, but Haley and Nick, were, you guys with your little ones were picking on you all this whole uh, series. But your Cannon needs to hear you too. He needs to see you two kiss and hug and he needs to hear you tell each other, I love you so much. And he probably even needs to hear you say once in a while, Mommy and Betty are going on a date, so you're going to stay with Grandma and Grandma or somebody else. That um, sometimes is uh, one of the best things we can do to provide stability, for, especially for the young ones. But even when they get into grade school and, and teenagers, you know, teenagers may act like, oh man, don't kiss in front of us. You know, don't, we don't even want to see that. But that uh, 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 says something to them that I guarantee you, if you could uh, open them up uh, psychologically, they would, they would reveal to you that I am so glad that my mommy and daddy love each other so much. And that I don't have to worry about it. So, so st stability it is a wonderful uh, enabling to, to give our children. And we can go about it even in the most topsy turvy environment. Um, questions or comments on that one? All right, let's segue to another of these. And I don't know, Nick, if it was you that nabbed me after class last week. I think it was, and you started. You started uh, uh, telling me uh, some other ability in the word. Yeah. You got some of those in your pouch? Yeah, your I thought pouch? I made them up. Remember, I was all excited. Oh, you made them up? Remember, hospitability? Hospita hospitability. And that's you laughed right. and said, that's actually a word. That, that, I, I'm going to just ask you to think about that some more, and I'm going to talk to you about this after class here just for a moment. Uh, maybe that's something we want to develop a little bit. So there are lots of things, well, I think if you put in your computer, give me a list of words that end with the suffix ability, it would be overwhelming. <coughs> you, you'd be surprised how many of these words come out. And some of them are words that maybe are stretching it a little bit as to whether they're real words or not, but I don't know. Anyway, let's go to accountability. We could have worded this one responsibility, same idea. I think we have a great uh, high calling by God to really be strong on this with our children. And it can be delicate at times because it involves <clears throat> what, did somebody interrupt me there? You didn't correct me. Oh, I hate it. Does it start out with that's wrong 
and then uh, maybe evolve or progress to where you finally talk about the big three-letter word sin? Or do you start right from uh, the, the moment Nicholas disobeys Nicholas and Haley, whatever age he is, maybe it's sassy, does Nick pull him aside and say, son, we need to talk about that. You're engaged in sin. I, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're chuckling here, but at what age do you, you don't, you don't as husbands and, and wives uh, sit down together and say, now, you know, this idea of sin, uh, it's, it's pretty heavy. It's, it's really theologically deep. So maybe we better hold off talking about that until our kids are fully capable of discerning. I don't know if that works. <laughs> I think you almost have to get a jump start. Uh, Nick, what would you do uh, if Nicholas sashed you? Would you say, so I'm not going to tolerate that sinfulness? <laughs> well, I kind of have, a, I guess, a question about it is, um, like obviously we'll teach like what's wrong and that kind of stuff, but is there is there really a difference? I feel silly asking this, but is there really a difference between saying something that's a sin and saying something's wrong? Like if we're telling them wrong, they would get the concept of sin, but they might not understand like the definition of it. understand maybe wrong at an earlier age than they do sin. Sometimes we might approach it in such a way that our, the kids aren't even getting the message. I, I remember the story of uh, one time when I was a young preacher student at Harding many moons ago, we would have uh, occasions where different ones would um, augment. Uh, we, well, there was something called the Timothy Club, and it would be more lighthearted, and but there was one occasion where J.D. Bales's wife uh, was uh, addressing uh, uh, the Timothy group, and she told the story. Now J.D. Bales was your, uh, he was brilliant, uh, but he was so uh, you know how you describe him? What J.D. How? So aspy. That's a code language for Asperger's. He, he just, uh, he, he was uh, in some ways out. It was like uh, he would forget he was supposed to lecture at Harding, run across the campus, the, the wind would blow his tie up around his neck, and he'd get there late, and he'd walk up on the stage and talk to you during chapel, and the whole time his these tiles wrapped on the flipping on the back side of this. And you think to yourself, who would who would not notice that? Well, he was just that. So anyway, Mary Bales was telling the story about one time when JD was uh, doing something, maybe just uh, standing or uh, speaking or something, and his young boy got really irritated with him, and he came up to him and he went to kick his leg to get his attention. And when he did so, he, he missed, and he twirled around and fell down. And he started crying, and J.D. looked, uh, the child said, Daddy, look what you made me do. And J.D. looked down at his little boy, I don't know, not very old at all, and said, Son, don't rationalize like that. <laughs> so, kid, little, little two-year-olds don't understand the concept of rationalizing. And that was just, uh, J.D. was on the living street. Fortunately, I think his kids turned out all right after a little bit of rocky uh, roads. <clears throat> but um, so, how do we teach accountability? Uh, how do we broach the not only the subject of you're doing wrong, and not just that it's wrong versus right or uh, good versus bad or righteousness versus sinfulness, but that when you do wrong, you're, you are responsible for your behavior. 
at what point do we begin holding our kids accountable, saying no, Nicholas, you hit your little brother, Luke, I saw you do it, so don't tell me you didn't do it. I, I saw you do it. So you need to tell your brother you're sorry. And you even need to be explicit and tell him, Lucas, I'm sorry I hit you. And maybe you even need to drill down deeper and say, why did you hit your brother? And are you going to do it again? Uh, Ron, that's your grandson. I think, uh, you know, Jesus said, you know, he's innocent children. So it's obviously the children, they're not doing it to sin. They're not, they don't know they're sinning. They might do it because they're inquisitive. They might do it because um, they're interested in, you know, like stick your finger in like sock. I mean, some, you know, they're, they're doing things because they don't really don't know any better. They just do it. They don't think about what they're doing. So even though they're doing wrong, you know, to a point, they're still innocent. They just don't know there, there is, uh, and this sends us down another uh, trail that uh, we have not really done a lot of. Uh, detail talking about uh, some groups would talk about being born in sin but there is something about children that there, there's something innate in us all I think that that we're we are by nature selfish creatures and again I'm, I'm going out on a, a limb here to talk about uh, this is ad lib, so I'm not prepared to talk. So if you have questions, make them easy ones if you would. But uh, you, you watch the normal child. Now, every once in a while, there's exceptions out there. Some of you maybe have had those and uh, maybe even been one of those. Whereas a, a child all throughout the growing up years, uh, they, they were just thrilled to share. Oh, hey, you want to play with my dog? Or you want, to, you want to play with my truck? You can take it and play with it and bang it around all you want. Most of the time, the reaction that you get from children is more of a, no, this is mine. And you, you can't have mine. It's mine. You get your own. So every once in a while, there will be an exception to that general rule. And then somebody will be, uh, you know, a, a parent might say, you know, I never have to talk to my child about sharing and uh, all of that. That's very seldom do you hear parents say, I never had to discipline my child. You wonder about the parent when they say that, maybe. We're skeptical a little bit. So uh, comments or questions on that? But when you bring up the subject of wrongdoing, and, and you know that it refers to sin, and you're trying to prepare the way to talk more intelligently on a level that your child can begin to grasp, but you have you when you when you talk about this, you, you have to you have to talk about accountability, and at, at some point then you have to talk about the idea of confession. Why why do I have to tell Lucas that I'm sorry for hitting him? Why? Well, what what's the answer that the parents will give? Well, because he's your younger brother and you love him, and we don't on each other like that. But uh, eventually, uh, you know, Nick's going to get to the point where he talks about, what is it, James 5, 16? Confess your sins to one another. So, uh, it, even at a young age, we start wading into the deep uh, teachings of Scripture about the, the ugliness of sin and how we go about coming to be right with God. Jeannie? Well, in my view, and I'm not, a, I'm not a parent, but there's a reason that we in the past have used that phrase, the age of accountability, which is not clear-cut and, um, and may vary a little bit from person to person. So my, my feeling is that when they're younger, and I'm talking at, at least 10, 12 before that, you bring them along and you teach them that, but they, they may not have developed enough to understand that. Yeah. But, if, but if they've never heard it before and 
they're 12 years old, that could be problematic. They could, they could, you know. Yeah, we almost use that phrase in our fellowship. You know, it's kind of church lingo in some ways that the, the age of accountability. What are you talking about? Well, that's the age when a kid can really make up his mind whether or not they want to be baptized into Christ. And we, we understand that. We accept that there's, a, there's a, a progression there. And having been engaged in camp work, uh, as we have as a church for a number of years, Oh boy, you know everybody that has any kind of tenure at all at camp, you don't have to have tenure out there uh, multiple years of service. To, even the first year, you, you might encounter that where a, a young child comes to you and their heart is golden and they understand enough to tell you that Jesus died on the cross for me, that he took my sins away, but they're only single digits. They haven't even gotten to be 10 yet. Uh, and sometimes then the tension is brought up because you pick up the phone and you call and say, hey, uh, your, your, your daughter want, wants to be baptized. And, and maybe you even broach the subject by saying, we want to know how you want to do it. Does daddy want to do it? Do you, do you guys want to meet us here at the camp tonight for it? And every once in a while you get, no, they are not going to be baptized. They are not old enough to be baptized. And there, sometimes there is a real stringent approach to that. Where, uh, you know, I've, I've had, as the director over the years, I've had a couple of parents tell me, I, my kid's going to come to camp this year and he's going to ask you if he can be baptized. And the answer is no. Now you take that as a camp director and sit on that for a while. And it would be okay if you knew, if you felt in your heart that the mom and dad were trying their best to give guidance. But uh, what really uh, makes it difficult is when you think they've never even broached the subject with their child yet. And yet they want to lay down this, okay, I'm, I'm, don't get me jogged up. <laughs> child is starting to be able to discern what's right and what's wrong is knowing the difference and kind of independently. And that, to me, that seems to be a process, not just you wake up one day, you know, or it, that they're able to count the cost of, of what their, their actions are. Uh, and that's, that's uh, a lot broader than just you know, what you're talking about. Well, I was circling back to come back to your point, but I'm, I appreciate your clarifying. We're not talking just about baptism here. We're talking about the development of the child. And, and what is it, the age of accountability? Well, that, that's so fuzzy. I mean, it starts from uh, almost from the time they start walking, at least. Uh, I... I don't think you can hold a little babe in arms accountable for much at all. But once they get their legs under them, it seems that they start to have a little defiance <laughs> built in with their independent spirit, their truth. Uh, being a grandparent, I think, and a parent, I think you have to start, like, like we said, at a certain age for certain ones, and we have to let them know when it's wrong for to hit another person or something. Um, <clears throat> I, we get the tribute, and we, I'm constantly picking it up saying, where this child was bullied at school, or, and they might have killed themselves, or even in college and everything. We've got to teach our children that it's wrong to do that. If we see someone doing it, we should stick up for that person and things like this. Um, I, I was terrible with that in school. We had a girl that was retarded, and these two boys picked on her constantly. And finally, I told them one day, I said, I'm going to tattle on you if you don't let her alone. And I did. But they, they knew not to pick on me because, unfortunately, my sister and I were terrible cowboys, and we would have pulled the tar out. <laughs> But today you hear 
so much about bullying in school. How do we handle that? How do we tell our children to stick up for that person? Anybody comments or questions there? It starts before, it starts with words. It starts with words. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I worry about that a little bit. Not, maybe I'm showing a side of me I don't want to show you, but sometimes that, that almost comes under the umbrella of political correctness. I know there's a lot of bullying goes on, but it seems to me like we're almost engendering an environment where if somebody looks at another person the wrong way, it's abusive. And I, I don't know how we, I, I, I don't know how to, uh, I don't know, I think comments or questions there? I, I mean, I, what did I tell you a while back that there was some, some major company had a, 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 a new rule among the integrated uh, workforce, male and female. Well, and it's, it not only goes beyond that, but it's uh, forget about sexual orientation. It's just among the work, workforce that uh, you can't make eye contact with. Uh, I think it said the opposite sex for more than two seconds. Something like that. If, if, if I'm not quoting you exactly. The point was uh, was so ridiculous that uh, what do you mean I can't make eye contact? You mean I can't look at Sue Geyser and say Sue, how you doing? It's good to see you since oh that was that was two and a half seconds. <laughs> that was flurry. I mean, it, it, sometimes it gets ridiculous, and sometimes I think uh, if we're not careful, we, we're gonna bring that same spirit among our little ones that, uh, I mean, there's a sense in which, I'm going to really get in trouble for this probably, but there's a sense in which the growing up and getting picked on and bullied a little bit it, is part of what toughens you up for the real world. So I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm all for what Trudy's saying, and we've got to really be careful there, but where do you draw the line? Well, you might reflect on your background in that there's, there's you know, they're part of fun, I guess you could call it, and you pick on each other, but you know when it goes too far, you remember the kid that was always picked on yeah. and by your locker. You know, I mean, that... Yeah, I, and, the, and you do uh, sometimes do rest. I, I often think that if it wasn't for me, my sisters would have never survived an adult because I helped them get ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kidding about that. Um, but I, I guess I'm just vent, venting a little bit. Sometimes uh, we just seem to be so so prone to want to isolate and insulate and protect to, to, to a fault almost. Was your hand up, Mom? Yeah. Uh, today, in today's world, parents have a harder time than uh, like my parents did with us years ago because the influence of TV, the uh, what goes on in TV, and kids try to imitate. You parents are uh, try to compete with the TV and try to. Uh, steer your kids in the right way. But TV has a big influence on the, uh, it's terrible the way they have. Yeah. Well, television and singing and songs and all that kind of stuff too, movies. Uh, Nick, Nick, you might have the last word on this. With the, the bullying that uh, Trudy was talking about, like we've had to, we're trying to be proactive about it, like talking to Nicholas about, okay, if you go to school and kids are mean and you know, and we try to spend time and talk to them about it, and what to do. Thankfully, uh, he comes home every day and says, no, nobody there would ever be mean. Like, they're all so nice. You know, he's absolutely loving it. But, uh, but also from my point of view, I'm trying to train up my kids. Um, it's a lot easier to stand up for people 
if you uh, if you're the one carrying the bigger stick. You know, um, it's a lot easier to um, to diffuse situations and to not have them escalate to a bad thing if they if they have the confidence and they have the tools to to de-escalate situations ahead of time, not waiting until they're in this you know hyped up situation and then and then things escalate out of control. Um, you know, we're trying to get that ahead of time. But. Good comment. Made me think of an episode of Andy Griffith where Opie got beat up. Yeah. And it ended up that uh, Opie kind of went into training. <laughs> and he went back and uh, when the guy picked him up and again, he whooped him. Even though he was quite a bit smaller. I don't know, is that acceptable today? Would we even consider that as, that's not, that's not even, uh, uh, that's not an acceptable solution today. Uh, that leads us to our next uh, segment of this, which we really intended to get in today, into today, and that is uh, social, social building. How do we enable our children to fit in, not, not to fit in in a good way or bad way? So, if we talk about this next Sunday, it is a pastoral Sunday, and maybe somebody else might be teaching the class. Uh, Gene and I might be out of town, I'm not sure on that. But if I'm here, we're going to pick up on that point, or maybe even if I'm not here, if somebody else is here teaching this class, uh, they might uh, begin right, right at that point. How do you uh, socially enable your children? How do you begin to get them ready for the world of their peers and uh, to make them, uh, as I say, to nourish them as to how they fit into society. Well, I think, uh, I think what Don says, you can probably the whole class just on that, is like watching TV. Yeah. And um, like I say, what comes in must come out. So it's like they're hearing the bad stuff on TV if they're playing music and it's bad. One of the boys one time had a CD that was that played. I'm not sure. I was kind of thinking it's Christmas. No, it was Christmas. I took it out. Those things are hard to break. There's no reason for you to listen to this. But um, you hear stuff like that all the time. It's going to be normal to you. You're going to start using slurs. If you're, going to, if you're seeing bad things happen to people, you're, you're going to think that, oh, that's normal. That's what people do. It's so important to, to watch what they're taking in. Yeah, if your kids are sitting around playing bank robber games from, you know, all their spare time chances are good, they're going to not do it real well. Jerry, one time in Portland, the kids were, it, it was summertime, you know how kids get bored. They were wanting to start to figure. Shane come home and everything, so they set up a boxing ring. In the backyard, and Shan was giving them lessons. They got over there bickering very, very quickly because they were learning how to box, and the ones that were picking on each other were teaching each other how to do it. So that lasted a while, but boy, when they got bored, phew. <laughs> Is that acceptable today? <laughs> well, a, few, a few years ago now, maybe as many as 10 or 15, we had a on one of our times at uh, Camp Judson, we had rented an inflatable, I'll tell you this and then we're done. Uh, inflatable boxing ring, and you wear a, a inflatable helmet, and I don't know, you, you box actually with uh, big gloves that are inflatable. But uh, I remember John Lombardi was determined, he said, I want to I wanna, I wanna fight you. And I said, okay, we'll fight. So, I, I got the pleasure of, I knocked him right out of the ring. <laughs> it was one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done. <laughs> he beat up on me pretty good. <laughs> but uh, my point is to say, you, now there's some, uh, we shouldn't be encouraging that at camp. Uh, but we, you know, we, do we want to teach the kids to punch each other in the face? And I don't know quite how to answer that. You know, I mean, I, I, under, I get their point, uh, but I kind of have to bite my tongue a little bit. All right, Gail, well, okay, well, you have the last one in the state one. Larry's older brother has three girls, and the two older ones, this is when they were kids, were uh, 
were just really scrappy, and then they run the day, you know, and each one's kind of, you know, you should just go fight it out. And so obviously the older one's happy about that, and he said, and I get to beat up the winner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Read our visitors today, please, if you see any. Oh, <laughs> yeah.